Good morning, Olive Branch family, and welcome to our online worship experience. We are so glad that you're here this morning, and we hope that you had a blessed and, and fun Christmas day with your friends and family. And as you might know, we're actually not in person today, and all of our church family is watching the service online. So um, we just want to welcome you all, and, um, and thank you for joining us. And hey, let us know in the chat where you're from, where you're watching from, and uh, let us know because we want to hear from you, and we miss you guys. Um, um, but we definitely wanted you to enjoy this holiday season and uh, what better way to do it by worshiping God at home and uh, at together on a, as an online family. But before we go into service, I just want to give a quick note here. Um, we just want to say thank you so much to everyone, part of this Olive Branch family for your giving this whole season and especially this whole year and we also want to encourage you that you do have an opportunity to give before the year ends um, and we definitely wanted to let you know about that so for more information you can definitely uh, take a look at our website at tob.ca and just a quick note um, if you want to give before the end of 2021 we have to receive everything uh, before December 31st so if you want to give that's great and we, we thank you for that um, and if you want to give before the end of the year you have to give it before December 31st. Um, so that's the little note that I want to uh, give you, but I'm so glad to go into service, excited for our worship team to lead us, excited for what Pastor Ken has a word for us uh, this fine day. And um, I want to encourage you that the Lord is always with you and he is with you, especially during the season. And we are here for you and we're praying for every single one of you. And if you have a prayer request, please let us know. We want to hear from you. Um, you can definitely uh, let us know and uh, we love to pray together as a family. Well, that's enough for me today. Have an awesome Sunday. Enjoy today's service. God bless you, and we'll see you in the new year.
been in this series called The Night Before Christmas, and uh, today I want to talk about the day after Christmas. Now, just to kind of give you an idea where we've been, the night before Christmas is actually the darkness, the gloom that was on this planet before Jesus Christ showed up and the light of the world came into it. And of course, we've talked about lots of things. The first thing that we talked about, first message, was on what the problem really is. Sin is the problem. And self is at the very core of sin. Uh, and all of its ugly children, self-importance, selfishness, self-centeredness, all of this stuff. So that's the issue. That's the problem that we have. One of the things that you find is the Christmas story is about how the sow, how the soul found its worth. How Jesus, when he came, brought worth to our souls because he was willing to pay for our sin. And something is only worth what somebody will pay for it, which means that we have infinite value. We are worth Christmas, as it's been put. Now, there's all different kinds of things, all kinds of different people. We talked about the cast of char characters. There's Mary, you know, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. Zachariah, I'm too old. Caesar, Jesus who? Herod, you know, I'm king. Tell this kid, king to get lost. Shepherds, got to go tell them. The priests, you know, who heard about Jesus, I know. So what's next? Magi, go and give your best gifts and then the innkeeper, we're full. And of course, all of us at some point in our lives play the innkeeper, where Jesus comes and he wants to have a part in our lives. Say, I'm full. I'm full of all kinds of stuff. There's no room for you. Then last week, we talked about uh, connecting the dots, that everything, every picture that we have on our iPhones and so on is made up of pixels. And the problem that we sometimes get into when we're trying to connect the dots is we end up mining the dot, like we get lost in one dot instead of understanding that there's a whole bunch of them that make up one picture. And all the dots that we see, and this, we talked about all the prophecies from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, the whole way down, how they all point to Jesus. All of these dots, son is given to us, you know, uh, the line of Abraham is going to be blessed, there's going to be a king from Judah, all of these prophecies all come down and point to Jesus actually fulfilling the prophecy. We talked about some of these dots in our own lives, how sometimes we can find ourselves in a place where it's summer, where bright yellow, things are going well, we just give, touch a door and it opens up, and then there's the fall of life, the fall dot, sacrifice, you know, and we just wonder, you know, our our hands get bruised when trying to push the door open, and it just doesn't work. Sacrifice, and we wonder if it's worth it. Then we hit winter, where everything feels frozen and dead and cold, and it feels like everything's gone, and then spring. Spring eventually comes. So I'm going to talk about, you know, the day after Christmas. Now, the day after Christmas, and that's what we are in right, you know, today, December 26th, you know, it's way different than the night before. You know, the stockings are no longer hung by the chimney with care. They're scattered all over the place, along with all the gifts and wrapping and paper. You know, on the day after Christmas, nobody wants to necessarily light up. I mean, you light up the tree, but nobody's pushing for it. Nobody's pushing for Christmas music or anything like that. And in fact, the day after Christmas is Boxing Day, so we want to take these gift certificates that we've been given and go out and buy something. Or you may have to return something. And of course, the lines at Walmart today are full, going out the door. Same with, you know, Best Buy. Everybody's coming back with the iPhone or whatever that doesn't work. In emotional terms, though, in emotional terms, and that's what we're going to be dealing with today, we've been to the mountaintop, and now we're making our way back to the valley. And that's the reality of life, isn't it? You know, if you've graduated from high school, you know, you're at the mountaintop. Your parents are proud of you. You wear your cap and gown, get your picture taken, and then you go to college. It's the valley. You realize, you know, university is way different than high school is. Or, you know, if you graduate from university, then it's kind of like, okay, this is great. I'm at the top, got my cap and gown, my degree, and so on. Then I have to go get a job. So that's the way it is. You get married. You know, you look, the, you look better than you've ever looked before in your life. All your family's there. Everybody's celebrating the fact that you've come together, you know. And then there's marriage, you know. <laughs> there's marriage, and it's up and down. That's just the way it goes, you know. Maybe you went off to some exotic vacation place like Hamilton or Timmins, and then you come back home again, right? That's just the way it works. Now, have you ever wondered what the Christmas cast did after Christmas? Like what it was like on the day after Christmas for them. 
You know, and the question is, like, if you're going to be in the hills and valleys, and we all find ourselves there, are there any, you know, guidelines for this kind of stuff? You know, in the day after Christmas, when you've got to clean up the mess, how do you survive the valley? Now, I'm talking about this from the perspective of the cast of characters in Jesus' birth. We're going to have to kind of use our emo- imaginations because, you know, 2,000 years ago, they didn't record their emotions. They didn't tell us, you know, well, this is a really high time. This is a low time. It sa- tells us in several cases that Mary treasured up things in her heart, some of the experiences that she had. So we aren't given too many details. Matthew's account probably gives us the best picture of kind of the day after Christmas, especially for, uh, for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Listen to what happened. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they, the Magi, remember they had seen the star, followed it to Jesus, you know, and so on, uh, find Jesus, you know, and then they gave their gifts and worshiped. It says they returned to their country by another route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That must have been terrifying. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so what was fulfilled, what the Lord had said to the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old, and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Now, there are some clues about when this all happened because it says, you know, when the Magi came there, they entered the house, okay, and they saw the child. Uh, Looking at what Herod had said about, you know, the time period, the, the ages of the children that he wanted to murder, two years old and under, it's likely that Jesus could have toddled up to the door when the Magi showed up. So um, he was a little bit older at this particular point. Now, I just want you to think about, you know, where Mary and Joseph must have been at this particular juncture. I mean, they'd had this rocket ride, you know, from Nazareth, you know, up to Bethlehem. So I just kind of charted some of this out for you, and I don't know how well it fits, but, you know, so Gabriel shows up. That's a high point, you know, scared her to death, but he shows up, tells her, this child is going to be the son of the Most High. Then she had to go tell her mom and dad. I'm guessing that had to be a valley. Then she went to see Zachariah and Elizabeth, you know, and that was a high point, you know. She shows up, Elizabeth, you know, prophesies over her. Then she had to go home and tell Joe, okay, tell Joseph. So Joe believes, that's a high, that's a high. Then they have to take the trip to Bethlehem. She's, you know, almost nine months pregnant at this point. And then she gets to Bethlehem and there's the birth of Jesus. But, you know, they have to go to the stable, and the baby's born in a manger or laid in a manger. Then there's the shepherds that come in. We saw these angels, and they told us, you know, what's going on, you know, that there should be joy to the world because God has shown up, you know. And then they had to adjust, you know. I mean, everybody has to adjust. So Mary had to adjust to being married to Joseph and also to motherhood, two things at the same time. Then the Magi show up high point. They come, they worship, they, they affirm that they follow the star, you know, and they, and they give gifts. And then they have to escape to Egypt. So you can see this is kind of the peaks and the valleys of just about any kind of, and you could put yourself in there uh, and just about any picture that you can show. So the Magi showing up was an amazing event. But then almost immediately after they left, okay, Mary and Joseph have to escape to Egypt. And so I'm guessing they're thinking, you know, because the angel's very emphatic, you know, get out of town, go quick, Herod's going to try to kill you. And I'm thinking that they're maybe saying to themselves, Mary and Joseph, you know, like, so like, where's the angel army? Like, why do we have to leave? Why couldn't, you know, an angel just show up? You send a medium-sized angel could kill off all these soldiers. But they didn't. And so they had to, and so, so they had to go. And then there's all of the stuff, you know, associated with that. I mean, imagine knowing that all these children that Jesus would have grown up with there in Bethlehem had pretty much gotten killed because Herod's soldiers came in and, uh, and murdered them all. So, and this is a long trip to Egypt. I don't know if you realize this, but it was 500 kilometers. So this wasn't like they leave overnight, you know, take the evening flight and get there. You know, there were no travel angels that showed them, showed up to whisk them off to Egypt. They had to go there on their own. And so this is, t- this is difficult. And the same thing for the Magi. You think about them. They had to go back to Babylon. 
Like, this is a long trip. This is like 1,200 miles and probably six months of travel. So this is, this, these are distant places, and they're just, it's not like you, just, like you just keep the thrill of having been there for all this time. And things still let, didn't let up for Joseph and Mary and Jesus. After Herod died, an angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go back to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So Joseph is an obedient guy. You know, he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he's afraid to go there, and for good reason. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, one of the things that becomes clear in this passage is that Joseph and Mary are trying to get back to Bethlehem, and I would suspect also trying to stay away from Nazareth. I mean, in Bethlehem, that's where the baby was supposed to be born. It's close to Jerusalem, and, and this baby's going to take the throne of his father David. And so all of these prophecies, they seem to be associated with being, you know, actually close to Jerusalem, or at least there in Bethlehem. And then there's another thing. <laughs> Nazareth was redneck country. I mean, you know, these you know, people probably drove around in pickups with gun racks in the back. I mean, this was, and they had this, you know, really weird accent. So, and that was not just that, it was them going back to scandal. I mean, it's very clear that in Nazareth, nobody believed what Mary had to say about the fact that God, you know, you know gave her this baby, that somehow this baby was from God. They thought she screwed up, and, and she's now trying to blame it on God. So there's just all of this stuff, and there's evidence in the Bible that this scandal, this scent of scandal, hung over their heads, and it was still around when Jesus went back to Nazareth later on. They also had all these other children, like they had James, Judas, Joseph, and Simon, you know, Jesus' brothers. And then Jesus also had sisters. All these kids had to grow up in the context of that scent of scandal, that stuff, you know, who knows what happened, what other kids said there in town. Now, and apparently, you know, Jesus, for the next 30 years, lived a pretty unspectacular life. He was known as Jesus the carpenter, okay? He followed in his father's footsteps. And, and took on the business there. He was a tecton, tecton, which meant that he was basically a construction worker. So these are some of the peaks and valleys. And you get some sense of where Mary was. There's a, there's a, um, there's a scene about 30 years later in Jesus' ministry where, where Mary and Jesus' brothers, they think he's gone nuts, and they actually show up and knock on the door where he's teaching to try and get him and take him like to the equivalent of an insane asylum back then. So how in the world do you go from, you know, this is going to be the son of the Most High, he's going to take the throne of his father David, to I think he's gone nuts, let's go and let's put him in an insane asylum. This is crazy stuff, okay? There are the peaks and valleys in life. And many times when you're in the valley, you begin to doubt what you've experienced on the mountaintop. I worked uh, for nine years, seven of them actually giving leadership to a large youth ministry at a place called Mahaffey Camp, okay? So Mahaffey, uh, very primitive setting, had, you know, what we called golf course bathrooms, you know, 18 holes in a path, no flush toilets, no showers, tents, you know, rows of cottages, some of them dating back to the late 1800s. But the kids seemed to come, you know, 400 of them usually showed up, you know, and so we would work with them. And this was the place where they reconnected with their friends, and many of them reconnected with God. Some of them had taken a long vacation from God, and now they were coming home. So our focus there was two services, and then we had as much as we could do there in, under primitive circumstances, no swimming pool or anything like that. But for them, this was the mountaintop. Now, as they left camp at the end, I knew they were headed for the valley. And of course, you know, uh, most of the girls would be hugging and crying, and the guys would maybe get a little emotional, but they were mostly enjoying the hugs from the girls and so on. Uh, camp romances would break up, you know, after 10 days of romance. And I knew that the valley was coming, and that they were going to get to a point where they were going to begin to doubt and struggle with the decisions that they had made at the camp there, saying that they wanted to follow Jesus. But that's part of the deal, isn't it? Marriage is another one, you know. 
you come in, you know, and, and you're making teary-eyed promises that you will always be there for each other. You're my best friend, you know, and that we will always care for, for one another. We won't attack each other when we get upset and so on. And we will stand together, you know, and we're going to, we're going to live out the definition of love, that love is kind and, and love is patient. Love is, you know, isn't jealous or rude or proud. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep a list of wrongs. We're going to live that out. Oh, you know, then sometimes you get into real life. Having a child is mountaintop experience, isn't it, you know? And then there's postpartum depression. And then there's this little thing, you know, about not getting enough sleep. You know, and this little child who's so doggone selfish, like they just want your attention all the time. They want you to feed them. They want you to change them. And they will not wait. (laughs) And that's kind of a challenge, isn't it? All of a sudden, learning to be selfless, which is a difficult thing to do. Now, here's my point. The valley, with all of its messes and chaos and struggles, is always predictable. It's always predictable. We need the mountaintops. We need those times when we can get up on top of the mountain and we can see further than we can see when we're down in the valley and we can get some perspective and we can feel the power and the presence of God. We need the mountaintops. We need the joy. We need to take the pictures. We need to do all these things that we do up at the top of the mountain. But you can't stay there. You can't live there. Now, in the records of Jesus' ministry, there's one mountaintop experience that stands out, and I want to talk about it for just a few minutes. And it was literally on a mountaintop. You know, uh, in fact, I wonder if maybe the word mountaintop experience kind of comes from this real life example. Let me read, let me read the account. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. These were the three top his inside crew of disciples, brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light, and then another appeared before them was Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, okay, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And then they looked up. There was no one there except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of God has been raised from the dead. And they're thinking, ah, doggone it. (laughs) What good is it to have an spiritual experience if you can't tell anybody about it? Now, I'm not going to get into the details of this account. This is a profound account, and there's lots of different waves of meaning here, except to say that this was an incredible experience. I mean, you can imagine being them. For Jesus, you know, to encourage him in the road that lay ahead of him, for his disciples to give them a glimpse of a spiritual reality that they couldn't see and to confirm their faith in Jesus. See, they knew Jesus as a very human person. I mean, they'd been with him, they'd camped out with him, they'd eaten with him, you know, and seen him, you know, angry, filled with joy, grieving, you know, frustrated, tired, weak. They'd seen him, all these aspects of him being a very real human being. To see this, I mean, this was astounding. Imagine somebody that you know, and all of a sudden seeing them get filled with light and power, and all of a sudden they become a supernatural being right before your eyes. And it's not just them. They're standing there talking with ancient prophets that have died, you know, decades, centuries before. I mean, this would be something else. So (laughs) they're overwhelmed. Peter, you know, he's always got to put his foot in his mouth, and he's, he's thrilled with what's happening. He just keeps on babbling, you know. It's like, hey, let's stay up here, you know. I'll, I'll get some tents, you know. I'll go out and get a camp stove, and we'll just stay here together. By the way, is everybody like s'mores, you know. We'll make some s'mores here. We'll have a little camp. You know, he just kind of goes off the top until finally, you know, God says, listen to my son. Listen to him. Now, people will risk their lives to climb mountains, We see this, you know, uh, there's the movie Everest that came out, remember that? And people will risk their lives, go up to, you know, at Mount Everest, you know, it's close to 30,000 feet up, so the air is thin, people freeze to death, people die, you know, before they get back down to the ground again. So mountain mountain tops are highs in life, that's why people go up there, right? When Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured, brilliant, 
powerful, having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. This was a place of power, immense power. And I'm guessing they thought, man, I have my doubts about Jesus, but just saying, never again, never again. See, what I hear God saying at this juncture is, you can't stay here. You just can't stay on the mountaintop, okay? And it's true, isn't it? Life is not one continuous high where you climb this steep slope, you know, and you finally give up, and then you live up there on top of the mountain. Or you're kind of on a plateau where everything goes on from that trajectory. No, that, that's not what happens. And when they get into the valley, what's interesting is there's a mess. And this is the difficult part. Listen to what happens. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder. And they ran to greet him. Why are you arguing with them about Jesus? He asked. Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. You go on there and you find out that this spirit actually would cause this child to throw himself into a fire, trying to kill him, okay? This is a horrible, horrible situation. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they, couldn't, but they could not. Well, this is different, isn't it? Quite a bit different than having a spiritually powerful experience where Jesus gets transfigured, and he's talking with Moses and Elijah about what is yet to come in his life. That's the mountaintop. But the valley is this messy place. It's powerless. Instead of, this is my son, you know, Jesus comments to them, you unbelieving generation, how long do I have to stay with you? It's a valley for Jesus, too. I mean, he's talking to Elijah, talking to Moses about what's next. He sees the kingdom. He sees the church. And then he comes down there, and he finds out that these guys who have been following him and following his example and listening to him can't cast out this demon, can't help this guy. And he knows they've got to get it if the church is going to survive. Now, I wish I could say that the valley after the mountaintop experience you know, is kind of a freak thing, you know, and, and if you're spiritual enough and if you pray enough and read your Bible enough, you can just avoid the valley. But if you're going to say that, if you're going to be more spiritual than everybody else so you don't have to go through a valley, you're going to have to be more, more spiritual than Jesus because Jesus hit the valley too. One of the biggest valleys was when he hit Gethsemane and he said, my soul is being crushed. I feel like I'm going to die. And there are other people in the Bible that have those kinds of experiences. Moses, oh my word, he had a lot of those experiences, you know, when he led the Israelites out of Egypt. You know, let me just kind of go over some of his mountain and valley experiences. If you let me do that here with my amazing drawing here. So he releases the slaves. That's a high point for him. Meets God, you know, and releases the slaves. And then he comes down to the place where there's no water. So they're saying, well, why don't we just go back to Israel? You brought us out here to die. <laughs> and Moses, it's like, they were feeding your babies to crocodiles. Well, at least we had plenty to eat back there. Crazy. Moses goes up to the top of Sinai, gets the law because the Israelites were too chicken to listen to God's voice, you know, and he comes back down. Remember what happened when he got back down to the valley? They're down there dancing around a golden calf, kind of a fertility rite. Man. And so God provides for them manna. This is amazing. Nobody has ever been fed like this. Water comes from a rock, comes back down. They're whining. You know, if you remember, you know, Dathan, he decides that he's going to try and take everybody back to, back to Israel. Then they cross, they get to the Jordan, and they're ready to go into the promised land. Remember what happens? People won't go in. They say, let's go back to Egypt. We'll find somebody who will lead us back to Egypt. So it's this up and down experience. Look at Saul or Paul in the New Testament, you know, meets Jesus, and then he goes blind, and he begins to preach the good news. Then they send him back home to Tarsus, you know. Then he meets the disciples, but they're scared of him, you know. And then they have the council in Jerusalem where they're going to try and, you know, cut out all the reaching out to the Gentile people, you know. And then he sees heaven. It's an amazing experience, spiritual experience, hits the mountaintop. And then he says, I was given a thorn in the flesh, so I wouldn't get a big head about it. And he goes to Rome, and it's just like this constant thing. Now, here's the interesting part of this, okay? Now, this is made up, okay? This is just my interpretation. But doesn't that kind of look like an EKG? Like, wouldn't it be a problem 
if somebody is just flatlined, <laughs> that's not a healthy person. EKG shows that there's a heartbeat there, and it's up and down. I just thought that was kind of interesting, okay? You have to go back to the valley once you've been on the mountaintop. The valley is a place of messes, you know. It's like, you know, right now there's all the leftover, you know, food from Christmas, and, and you're still going to be eating it for four days straight. And then when you're done eating it, you're going to make turkey soup, and you're going to be eating that for another two days, okay? Leftovers is all the stuff laying around the tree that you now have to clean up afterwards. They have to take down the Christmas tree and put away the lights, We've been in the valley of COVID now for, you know, about 21 months. Valley of COVID is a place of fear. And you have to remember, caution yes, fear no. It's where people walk by you and they avoid you like you're going to kill them with your breath. Valley of COVID is where you're trapped in your own apartment and trapped in your own house and you haven't seen the people that you love. I mean, you like to rip a hole in the wall with your bare hands. Valley of COVID is a place of fear and frustration and anger and desperation and isolation. And after Christmas, now with all the stuff that's going on now with Omicron and stuff, this is where we go back, right? And the hardest thing about any valley is a feeling of powerlessness. You're down in the swamp. You don't have the perspective. And you feel many times like you just don't have any power to change anything. The valley is a place of opposition, too. It's a place where you walk into it and your stomach knots up. For some of you moms, you know, it's a place where you feel like you're disrespected. It's opposition. It's where, as a parent, you feel like your kids have decided not to live out anything that you ever taught them. It's interesting. I wondered about the valley thing, and I, I think Jesus sends us back to the valley, not so he can discourage us, it's because the valley needs us. It's because the valley is probably more real than the mountaintop. It's because there are lots of people in the valley and they need us. They need our encouragement and they need our, and need our help. And yet the population of our world, for the most part, lives in the valley. Yeah, you know, there are the mountaintops and get a new car and you, your kids graduate and so on. All these things happen. But the ultimate landing place is the valley. Like, what's, when life is done, where are you? Now, there are times, however, when we're in the valley, and it's not just after the Christmas mess, or it's the blues, you know, that you feel after your favorite team gets crushed in the Super Bowl, or anything like that. Here's what I find fascinating. Both, you know, Moses and Elijah met with Jesus on the mountaintop that day, where God showed up in power and, it's, and it had this experience afterwards. But then they also went back to the valley after this. And I already talked a little bit about Moses, but Elijah had probably one of the most powerful mountaintop experiences ever. And yet, when he had to go back to the valley, I think there's some things there that we can learn about what to do when you're in a valley, like an intense valley. What I found fascinating is how God helps him to kind of regain his footing. You know, God doesn't take him to the wood shop, you know, the woodshed and shame him into, you know, changing his mind. He's filled with grace and he's filled with kindness in how he treats Elijah. And I just want to kind of walk you through this experience because I think it might be helpful. Let me just give you a briefing on how this happened, how this all came down. The historical accounts are actually found in 1 Kings chapter 18. So Elijah served Israel as a powerful prophet. Now, if you remember, Israel had a bleaker history than Judah, okay? So they had split by that time. Israel like, took this downward path almost right away. Got to a point where they had a king by the name of Ahab, incredibly wicked king. And what made it worse was that he was married to a woman named Jezebel. Now, you've probably heard that name before, and I'm telling you, this woman lived up to her name. She was the most wicked woman in the Bible. So together, these two people flipped off God and, you know, and flipped, you know, flipped off the God of Israel for Baal, you know, the storm and fertility God of all the nations around them. Now, the problem with this is the fact that it wasn't just them. It wasn't just Ahab and Jezebel who had this little thing going. They were leading the whole nation off the rails. And God could see what was coming, that they were going to get taken over by the Assyrians if they did not learn to listen to God. 
So he sent Elijah. So Elijah comes and he basically says, you two aren't listening to God. I'm paraphrasing here. You two aren't listening to God. So there's going to be a drought for three years. And there was a drought for three years. Got to the point where everybody's desperate for water in that part of the world especially. You know, everybody needs water. So Elijah basically says to Ahab, he says, okay, he said, let's, let's have a contest. Let's have a power encounter between Baal or Baal, however you want to pronounce it, and Yahweh. So he goes up to the top of this mountain. They built two altars there. One of them is for Baal and for his prophets. And there was a whole bunch of them, hundreds of these prophets up there. And then there's Elijah, the sole prophet of God up there. So he says to the prophets, go ahead, you know, see if, if you can get your altar lit. You know, the, they had the bull on the altar, all the firewood and everything like that and so on. So these guys danced around this altar, prayed to Baal, and they were just like, they were in a trance. They're getting carried away. They're cutting themselves and blood's going all over the place. You know, and Elijah, he's just kind of making things worse for them. You know, he's saying, well, he says, maybe Baal's on vacation, you know. Maybe Baal is, you know, sitting on the toilet. He actually said that, you know. Maybe he's going to the bathroom, you know. So he's, like, making things worse. And they're, like, going crazy, trying to get their God to answer their prayer and light this, this altar on fire. So finally they finished around the time of the evening sacrifice. I'm guessing probably around 5 o'clock in the evening. And when it was Elijah's turns, he had his ser servants dump gallons and gallons of water on their fire. You know, so water would have been very expensive anyways. But it was the challenge of also soaking everything. And then he prays this prayer. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, some of you are not familiar with this. You just haven't had much experience. So you're thinking, well, maybe he poured that culture's version of gasoline on there and just had a, you know, a spark or something. And so I, I can understand why you would think of that because of the fact that miracles always seem strange. But the basic intent here is that this, this was a, an intervention by God, an astounding, incredible intervention by God in a critical situation. Who's God? Who's God, really? And the people, when they saw this, are captivated by his power. That this God that they have served, that they've heard about, is not like all the other gods of the nations around them. Now, Elijah, when this happens, so it's still very dry. There's not a cloud in the sky. So, he, you know, he says to Ahab, he said, you better get in your chariot and start heading back, you know, to your capital because it's going to rain. So, <laughs> anyways, he apparently did. And it goes on to tell us that Elijah filled with God's power, he ran ahead of the chari chariot uh, from Mount Carmel back to the palace. This is like 17 miles. So incredible, incredible run, okay? First long-distance runner. When Jezebel heard about this, she was mad as, well, <laughs> the place where she got all of her inspiration from, you know? And her comment was, you tell that little prophet guy, that you better watch, because he's as good as dead. So you're thinking that Elijah would say, hey, listen, my God just burned up a sacrifice on top of the mountain there, so you're not scaring me. <laughs> That's not what happened. He ran for his life. What happens in this story is kind of shocking, and then it's kind of inspiring. I mean, if you want to put it in terms of our culture, imagine Billy Graham, you know, who, you know, great evangelist and so on. So he's had this massive, you know, series of meetings in a city and tens of thousands of people have responded, you know, to Jesus and so on. And then he goes back to his home in North Carolina and he says to Ruth, he says, I am done with this. Call the association. Tell them I'm not doing this anymore. You know, I'm just, I'm retiring. <laughs> like that would happen, okay? It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down underneath it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. 
Now, God does what he often does in times like these. He sends an angel. This is kind of his doctor angel that he sends. And the first thing that this, this angel does is let him sleep. He sits there and lets him sleep, you know. And then when he wakes up, feeds him. Some of you parents are familiar with this process, you know. Your kids get crabby. You give them something to eat, and then you put them down for a nap. So that's what happens here. And then, you know, he wakes up, and he gives them something to eat again, lets them sleep some more. Sometimes when we hit an overwhelming val valley in life, God, God's main thing is for us to get healthy. Because a lot of times our battery's drained. We're in burnout mode. And we're not thinking like we would think as healthy people. And so God wants us to be emotionally and physically and spiritually healthy because we're exhausted. And that's not the time for God, you know, to answer a prayer like, please kill me, I'm no better than my parents. No, no, God's going to get you healthy again because when somebody says that, that's not a healthy person's prayer. And it's in these moments that we need to get healthy before we make any decisions about what we're going to do and who we're going to be and what we're not going to do. It makes sense, doesn't it? Because when we were in the valley, many times life is dark. We don't see any way out. And if we're exhausted spiritually and physically, then it's going to get very dark indeed. very next thing that the angel does is he leads, he leads Elijah to listen for God. So Elijah is one of these guys, you know, he's seen the immense power of God, like he just saw on top of the mountain there. So he's in this cave, he's looking outside of this cave, you know, looking, and, and so there's the smashing of rocks. This wind comes through and just smashes stuff. But God's not in that. And then there comes this hurricane, you know, and then there comes this, you know, storm, and then comes, you know, a fire. And what God actually does is he speaks to Elijah in a whisper. And he says to Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And, of course, the real reason that Elijah was there is he's kind of feeling sorry for himself, you know. He says, you know, I'm the only one left. All of the people have left you. I am the only one left. And the answer that God gives is, you're not the only one left. I have 7,000 people who have not bowed their knee to Baal. But sometimes in our self-pity, that's what we think, don't we? And you grab our blankie and sit in the corner and suck our thumb, you know, and we think, you know, it's all over, you know, there's nobody else out there. I'm the only one in this kind of pain. Next thing that God does is send Elijah back the way he came. And he tells him to prophesy over a leader of an army in another nation and so on. And basically the intent there is, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you. I want to still use your life. And he does. And the final piece, to prove to Elijah that he has a legacy, he sends him to this little young guy by the name of Elisha. So he goes to where Elisha is. Elisha is plowing his fields. Now you have to understand, he's got 12 pairs of oxen and he's plowing this field. For somebody to have 12 pairs of oxen, they had to be, back in that culture, immensely, immensely wealthy. So when he comes, he throws his mantle over him. And, you know, and of course, Elisha knows exactly what's going on. Elijah pretends like he doesn't. But Elisha goes back, tells his parents, I'm going, I'll be leaving soon goes back out to the field, you know, and sacrifices all, it's like, you know, 24,000 pounds of meat, you know, and has all these plows and stuff that he uses to make the fire. And then he gets up and he follows Elijah right then and there. Sometimes, sometimes, in fact, usually what we need is companionship. And that's what Elijah needed. So you see it, right? You see the pattern? We need to rest up especially if we're depleted and we're in the valley. We need to get healthy again. We need to hear God's voice and understand that he speaks in lots of different ways. He speaks very differently. You know, not the echoes of the pity party that we have going on in our heart. We also need to re-engage. But we need to do it differently, which is what Elijah does here. And then we need to get help. Interesting thing, the difference between Elijah and Elisha is Elijah kind of goes on by himself. He has a servant who helps him out. But Elisha not only has a servant, but he has a whole company of prophets. And he's working with this company of prophets, creating a greater legacy. So he has a community around him. And we need a community. We were never meant to live our lives alone. 
Jesus makes an ongoing promise to people who find themselves in the valley. And that might be where you find yourself. And it's not just, you know, the valley after Christmas. It's not just the day after Christmas. Like, this is a serious valley, and it's been a time coming. And you feel like you're down at the very bottom of it. You need to know that the valley isn't the end. When Moses went from Mount Sinai down into the valley, that wasn't the end of his leadership. When Elijah, you know, went from the mountaintop, you know, and everything that had happened up there down into the valley where he wanted to die, that wasn't the end. Jesus calls out to us when we're in our valley, and this is what he says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. One of the things that we see from Jesus' life, that the mountaintop for him was excruciatingly painful because that's where he died. The valley that came next, like it seemed like it was the end of everything. And if it had stopped there, it would have been the end of history. It would have been the end of everything good. He was buried there, but that's not where it ended. Afterwards, he ascended, came out of the grave, and ascended into heaven. Easter changed everything. And God is at work in your circumstances. I don't know what he's doing, but I know he's at work. And I know he has something he's going to do through your life. Rest up. Re-engage. Get help. Amen. God, I pray that you will help us, Lord, in this next year to have the sense to not travel alone. To make sure that we have a community of people around us. That we engage in your ministry, that we remember, God, that the valley is not the end of our lives, it's not the end of the world, it's not the end of our dream, it's not the end of anything. Sometimes it's the beginning. Sometimes it's where we crash and burn and come to the end of ourselves. And then you can raise us to new life and do new things through us. God, give us faith, not just for the mountaintop, but for the valley too. In Jesus' name, amen. You're heading into 2022, and there will be mountains in 2022, and there will be valleys, and God will be with you through the whole thing. So may he walk with you, may he re-energize you, and may he give you a community of people to live with and work with. Amen.
his bride. 